quantum physics has shattered everything we thought we knew about reality, and it has put an end to the idea that what you see is what you get. Newtonian physics. It's very similar to what's happening in biology, where epigenetics has completely destroyed the idea of genetic determinism. And it is replaced with what's unseen actually shapes what is seen. And there is no more straight line thinking about how reality actually works. Today's podcast is inspired by a DM I got on TikTok where she said, Assalamu alaikum, my name is this. I have been reflecting deeply on the nature of reality and how it's connected to the Quran and quantum physics. And I'd love to share my ideas with you in order to get a deeper Islamic view. So we talked back and forth and it was this long message that she gave me and I read every single word of it. And it ended with SubhanAllah, this is exactly what I feel. And like these concepts go beyond what we are taught to think about and still ties back to what Islam has always said at its core. It makes me realize that I am not crazy for thinking this way and that it's just touching on something people used to talk about, but we kind of lost along the way. And because I love how she felt comfortable enough to talk to me and ask, that is what my account is about. You can have the best of both worlds, but this is what people are not educated on. And I am so grateful for my education in Islamic thought and how to bring those two together without compromising faith. While I did study engineering and was on the board of my university's physics association, I'm not a physicist and I will not be going into the details of how Islam proves science. I personally hate that. And as someone who's gone through the Quran line by line for the past eight years, I'm very strict about cherry picking. But what I do want to talk about is what has happened in Islamic history and world history of theories that has placed us in this amazing time in which science, especially when it comes to epigenetics and quantum physics, really opens up how we see the world. So without further ado, let's get started. In order to understand quantum physics and all of these sciences when it comes to Islam, we have to look at history and how that connects, right? We have Islamic history, which we don't talk about most of the time. And if you want to go to the Knowledge Hub, I have a couple of books on history, which I love, which really opened up my mind. As an American, I learned American history, but you have to go from the middle world. That completely changes the dynamic. So I learned both of those and I'm putting it together for you in this podcast. So let's start off with the fact that Islam started in Mecca, Medina. Okay, Islam. We're not talking about Adam. We're not going all the way back. So by the time of the Prophet Sallallahu when he passed away, it was spreading, right? They were leaving that area and they were getting into like Syria and other parts of the world. We had the four Khalifa Rashidun. So even with Abu Bakr, they were getting more lands, right? And then it was getting bigger and bigger. After the four Khalifas, we had more of like an empire where a family was ruling. So you had the Umayyad Khalifa. After that, you had the Abbasid times. Under the Umayyad rule, it was very, very Arab, right? It was about the Arabs having control. But after that, there was a revolt. And then you had the Abbasid time in which they had the campaign of everybody is included, right? So this is called the Golden Ages. And it lasted for a long period of time. But what also happened during this time is that two worlds collided. When you are getting out of your zone and you're going into another zone, guess what? The ideas start intersecting. So the Muslims started interacting with philosophy from places like Greece, on the other side, Chinese, Persian, Indian, right? So this created a lot of problems as Muslims became split. So you had people like the Muslim philosophers, like Ibn Sina, well, as new schools of thought, they were saying, we need a new school of thought. Like we don't understand what they're talking about and we need to refute them or it's going to take over the ideals and the, the beliefs that we have within Islam. So this is when they started creating schools of thought such as the Mutazla, the Ash'ari, the Maturidi, as well as the Athari. Let me just give you an example to simplify the differences between this and how modern science proves just one of them to be right. So the question was, is the universe created? Does it have a beginning or is it eternal? So this was a central theological and philosophical dispute within classical Islamic thought. So you have a couple of views. I'm going to put it into a table for you. So the Mutazilites say that the universe did have a beginning in time. The Ash'ari said that the universe had a beginning and it is actually recreated at every moment. While the Muslim philosophers like Ibn Sina said, the universe is actually eternal. It has no beginning. Isn't it interesting the, the way the new age people talk, right? And I've read several books and it's on the Knowledge Hub. The 1% of people might want to read this, but I, I love reading them and finding the connection in which they use the word universe interchangeably with God. So this might actually be the source of why they're doing this because they believe that the universe is eternal and it doesn't have a beginning. So who was right? So if we look into scientific history, especially from the Western point of view, it started back in the 1900s. So in the 1920s, Alexander Fradman independently derived equations from Einstein's theory of relativity that suggested that the universe was actually either expanding 
or contracting. It was actually supported by Edward Hubble's observation in 1929, which showed that the distance of the galaxies are actually moving away from us with faster galaxies actually moving further away. And what is this theory known as? The Big Bang Theory. So let's go back to our table. So we talked about the beliefs in the universe in which those three groups had a different uh, understanding. But does it align with something that we now know to be true? The Big Bang Theory. According to the Mutazila, it really strongly supports it. According to the Ash'ari, it supports the beginning, but it doesn't talk about the ongoing recreation that is untested until we get to quantum physics. And then the philosophers who said that the universal is actually eternal and it has no beginning, they became refuted. So the Muslim schools of thought that were invented during that time actually contradicted. They were the right ones. Now it's being proven that they were the right ones about the, the fact of how it works. So the Big Bang Theory actually backs up the scholars of the Mutazila and the Ash'aris. But it was quantum physics, which is more recent, that took this even deeper. It showed that the cause and effects are not actually fixed as we thought they were, which fits the Ash'ari's idea that Allah is constantly creating. So the way that it works, if, you, if you're not familiar with the school of thought, is think of it like movies, right? You have a scene. So the scenes are being created for you and you can have, you know, independent power. We'll, we'll talk about that at another time. But that's what the Ash'aris believed and that it's just not, the world is not running on autopilot. So that is a very interesting uh, point of view in which when you cross-reference those two worlds, you see something very different. So I want to end with my favorite connection between these two, which made the girl I was DMing say SubhanAllah. And that is about how could what we know about dreams Islamically be related to quantum physics. So let's finish off with that by looking at the Sunnah or the Seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Have you ever had a dream that felt too real to be random? Have you ever experienced or seen your future only for it to happen a few months later? Now, this is for real. Several Sahabas have reported some things like this in which they have seen people who have passed away, right? They've communicated with them in the seer of the Prophet Sallallahu seeing things and the Prophet even taking them very, very seriously. Let me give you a very basic one because I'm really hoping that this podcast creates that intellectual, spiritual, we bring that together, right? We're not too extreme on each end. So they were trying to figure out in which way they should be announcing for prayer five times a day. So a companion named Abdullah ibn Zayd ibn Abd Rabi saw in his sleep that a man was carrying a bell and he said, would you sell me the bell so that I can use it to call people for prayer? The man in the dream replied, shall I not show you something better than this? And he taught him the words of the adhan, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. When Abdullah woke up, he immediately went to the Prophet Sallallahu And this is something that they did very, very commonly. And he told him about this dream. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, this is a true dream, inshallah. Teach these words to Bilal, for he has a stronger voice than you. Then, and this is the amazing part, Umar ibn Khattab rushed to the Prophet Sallallahu saying the same thing. Oh, Messenger of Allah by Allah, I saw the same exact words in my dream. And then two more companions had the same dream that same night, confirming that it was divine inspiration. So the Prophet Sallallahu said, Alhamdulillah, this is a confirmation from Allah. How does that happen? How does that happen? I don't know. Y'all y'all tell me because <laughs> we're not supposed to explain these things, right? These are just things that happen. And they kept on happening, you guys. Like, there are so many interesting stories within the seerah. So many. It sounds like science fiction, actually way better. But another thing that I always talk about is that we're so focused on hadiths. Uh-uh. Hadith sciences are very complicated, but the seerah connects the two worlds together. But that is something that we have lost, what we're not being educated on, and that's really causing us a lot of problems nowadays. And that's really causing us a lot of extremeness. So you have people who are like Ahlul Hadith, who are very concerned about Hadith. And then you have people who are very concerned about the Quran and say like Hadiths are fabricated. So the best way to connect this is to stick to the seerah and it will actually show you what is actually fabricated or not because it just literally does not make sense. So that's just, that takes a little bit more studying, a little bit more effort on your part, but uh, you know, it makes sense. I think that's the hard thing that we have. It does make sense. It's just hard because we don't have a lot of people working to make it clear while, you know, you have advertisers who are like bombarding you with information on a regular basis. So certain things are made easy because of the system that you live in. You cannot fall to the system. You have to create it. You have to be proactive. And that's what I do. So if you look at history, dreams were never dismissed as imagination. The Prophet ﷺ himself has said that dreams are a sign of prophecy. Scholars that we don't talk about and are like really controversial about whatever, it's a part of history, they were authentic. It's a scheme of postmodernism in which we look at people, scholars in history, and we say, oh, they're not good. They did all of these bad things. 
a trap of postmodernism because that keeps you disconnected from your history and people who are disconnected from the history are huge traps for the system. You don't have anybody to rely on so you look like you know a fish out of water so you trust anything. So scholars like Ibn Arabi and Imam an nawawi even developed frameworks of interpreting dreams. So they had rules of telling when a dream is actually divine, self-generated or from shaitan. We hear about that all a lot of the time. But in modern times we are being trained to treat dreams as meaningless like just neurons firing. They couldn't possibly be anything real, right? Like there's no afterlife. So this is a really an interesting point of view. But if you look at quantum physics and you go into depth about it, it suggests that reality itself is a field of possibilities until it is observed. The line between imagination and reality starts to blur. It's so amazing. As somebody who is spiritual in the sense of like connection, not just like religious, but the connection between these two worlds, that is fascinating. I, I can't believe we've come to a time where it's proving itself that way. So maybe dreams aren't just in your head. Maybe they're glimpses of the unseen, moments of your soul, your ruh interacting with the fabric of reality before the body even catches up. So Islam has always treated this seriously and if quantum physics now says that consciousness actually affects matter, what a time to be alive, you guys. And as somebody who grew up in the STEM field, we always talk about pseudoscience, right? Like all of this stuff, pseudoscience, if it's not concrete, we can't believe it. There were people who would look down on others because of pseudoscience, like psychology. But it was about how our own tradition have explored realities beyond what the eyes can see. Even Arabi talked about levels of the unseen. Al-Ghazali, who was within the Ash'ari school of thought, questioned these realities before even quantum physics even hinted at it. And yet somehow along the way, the curiosity has been silenced, right? We don't talk about this kind of stuff. It's sad. And there's so much politics in Islam that is stopping us. And what I really hate and why I wanted to talk about this is the fact that she felt comfortable enough to DM me and she wasn't a typical Muslim. And how many non-typical Muslims have messaged me? When I say like IA, which stands for inshallah in emoji and text talk, the person said, I'm sorry, I don't understand. I'm just getting back into this. So there's a lot of people who don't feel like they have a place within the deen, that when the two worlds collide, they can't find the happy medium and they just go on one extreme or the other. And I'm hoping that this podcast would help people like that. That's who I care about. That's who I was. And anyways, everything else is boring. So we've started thinking about science like it's in a lab. It's something that you get a degree for, right? And spirituality is something that happens on the prayer mat. You know, that's where religion is. We separated the two worlds. And as somebody who studies systems, my whole thing is everything is interrelated. Every single thing is interrelated. Everything works together. And unless we can see the world as a system that's connected, then we're gonna have a hard time finding solutions. That's why we can't find solutions to the societal issues that we have because we're separated. So I'm hoping that this opened your eyes and that's what I intend on doing with this podcast. If you want to support especially this type of podcast, because a lot of people just want to debate. A lot of people are not thinking about the audience itself. Make sure to purchase any of the things below. I don't do collaborations because I do not have time. I have three young kids. And the whole idea is you will get a course. You will get a lot of perks for it because I don't believe in free. So if you really enjoy this, make sure to support it. And the next one, what are we going to be talking about? It's going to be interesting. We're going to be talking about the disconnect, the historical disconnect in which we have separated everything and the hearts are dead. You have too many religious people who have no soul. They're just walking. They're just talking and nothing is happening. So we'll talk about this from an Islamic point of view, an Islamic thought point of view, and then separate it from a secular world point of view. And how do those connect? What does your mind do? What does the heart do? How are they interrelated? So until next time, peace.